A soldier arrives to greet the grieving Peterson family, who recently lost their eldest son, Caleb, in the service. His name is David, and he served with Caleb, and he promised his friend he would check on his family. The Peterson family is moved by David, and he quickly becomes a close family friend. But sinister things begin happening around the Petersons, and they soon realize David is not who he appears to be. Now it's a tense cat and mouse game between a psychotic, possibly superhuman soldier with a mission and a family unprepared for a monster in Adam Wingard's 2014 thriller, The Guest. I'm Connor Izagari. And I'm Austin Johnson. And you are listening to Filmgasm. Happy Wednesday, listeners. This is the Filmgasm podcast, a genre film podcast that focuses on horror primarily with sci-fi, fantasy, and action peppered throughout. This is our 94th episode, and it's a subtle, soft thriller that doesn't get nearly enough mainstream attention. Hard to believe we're coming up on our 100th episode, not counting the bonuses. Uh, We have the topic picked out for the 100th, and it's going to be quite a weird one. Horror purists ought to love it. (laughs) (laughs) We won't say it yet, but it's going to be a big one. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Something that is... um, accessible too at the moment so that's yeah, good quite actually surprisingly more accessible than i thought yeah yeah but uh for now the guest but first i've got three updates for you on the rewind one for episode 16 child's play one for episode 17 the conjuring and one for episode 70 the matrix first up the trailer for the upcoming sci-fi channel series chucky has debuted with Don Mancini as showrunner and Brad Dourif reprising the role of everyone's favorite evil doll, Chucky. After last year's disappointing Child's Play remake, this looks like a welcome return to form for fans. And uh, what are your thoughts on that? Have you seen that trailer? Yes, I saw the trailer. Um, not quite sure if I'll have time for that. Uh, you, you know how it is, right? It's um, <laughs> yeah. I, TV. I, I, I've spoken before about, I love TV. When it, when it, when it, gets its hooks in me i really get committed to it but it, it takes a special show yeah so I, I i would need um uh, probably a recommendation for this one fair enough uh i think it's cool that brad doris coming back to play chucky i mean i think he's the only one who should ever be playing chucky i mean that voice is iconic and don mancini's the perfect guy to run this show i mean it's his baby yes it's been his baby since the beginning i think it i'm worried about the, it being on sci-fi channel I think it's going to be way too tame for audiences because the people who are watching this are longtime Chucky fans. No casual viewer is going to tune into this. That's exactly, that's me, right? Um, That's me. So yes, you you're, you hit, you hit the nail on the head there with the sci-fi channel. Um, If if it were a different production company, such as, you know, HBO or something like that, I'd be much more inclined to, Hey, they're going to be able to take care of this, spend the right amount of money on it, whatever. How about shutter? I mean, Come on. Well, well, yeah, that would be I. That that would be the most ideal, um, right? You know, you just watch it right there and on the streaming service. That would be amazing. They need a bone. <laughs> yes. Creep show. I don't think was the monumental hit they were hoping for. I, they need something to to draw in big crowds, and Chucky could have could could have been it. Yes. But I guess we'll never know. Next up, and this should come as no surprise, The Conjuring Three has been delayed to summer 2021. The film is rumored to be about a case in which a demon allegedly possessed a man and compelled him to commit murder. Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga are returning as demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren, but James Wan will not be directing. Uh, This was set for November of this year. It's now coming out in, I think, August of next year. And uh, I'm not shocked. I mean, yeah, okay, of course. Yeah, you know, we can can, can either uh, move on or keep talking about how movies get keep uh, get keep pushed back. So let's just move on. <laughs> I think that is it for 2020. We're never, I don't think we're getting anything else. That's it. Apart from stuff coming up on streaming, might as well just, you know, throw in the towel. <laughs> just leave it. Yep. yep. Fight's over. We lost. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> we, didn't even, we didn't even put up a fight. We didn't. Yeah. yeah. An interesting story regarding The Matrix came out this week. Cinematographer Bill Pope says that while shooting the Matrix sequels, the Wachowskis were obsessed with a method of directing that Stanley Kubrick used, in which a large number of takes are utilized to reduce the actors to their most raw performances. 
It made the set a living hell at times, and frankly, the final product was not worth it. They were reading a book by Kubrick, and his was, you know, drain your actors to their most emotional performance, and you will get the true pay dirt, which may have worked for Kubrick at the expense of a lot of, <laughs> lot of mental anguish, but uh, the Wachowskis? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. The Matrix 2 and 3, did you see some a lot of raw performance in there? Because I didn't. <laughs> I, really? Because I thought I really thought Keanu was just like going. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not even a huge fan of those movies at all. Um, I, that that, that kind of cracks me up that people also Kubrick is such a different time, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a time when, yeah, you, you could kind of this is sad, but get away with those things. <laughs> so yeah, that was just, that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. I love that they tried that and what they got was two pretty lukewarm sci-fi action thrillers that don't even come close to the first movie. <laughs> I'm, I, I, there's moments I like about each of, yeah. uh, of the matrix sequels, but overall they're just weak movies. Yeah, exactly. And well, yeah, you, when you're comparing it to that just monstrosity, classic from 99 what, what are you gonna do yeah exactly <laughs> so the guest so had you ever seen this movie before yes i watched this movie um shortly after it came on to netflix right you know and uh i remember watching it and being kind of kind of like whoa this is better than i anticipated i thought i was turning on a movie that i could kind of have on a you know on the background that is not so because this movie's built built a lot on atmosphere and sounds and kind of keeping you keeping you on edge without totally allowing you in, right? Yeah. Um, so I remember I remember that those emotions happening, and I was like, oh, I gotta like show this to somebody. So I, that's what I did. I was like, let me see what some older people think about this. <laughs> so I so I asked my older brother, you know, Adam, um, who loves movies and isn't the you know isn't the most you know well versed in horror or or anything uh, of, of that genre. But uh, he, he was like, he was really interested. He was like, yeah, it looks interesting. So me and him and some of his friends watched the film and we were like, yeah, that was really good. You know, we talked about it. It has some interesting ideas. And then I kind of, kind of forgot about it. Just, you know, 2014 is a very, very heavy year. You got, you know, off the top of my head, you got Whiplash, Birdman, Gone Girl, you know, Selma, uh, boyhood, Grand Budapest Hotel, just this, you know, monster seer of all these great movies. And so the guest, just like As Above, So Below, which we did recently, got, got a bit lost. And so when we, did, when we drew it in the book, I was like, hell yeah, because I knew we were going to be doing Whiplash around here. It's great to have that 2014. We're doing Whiplash on the Oscar Sunday show. Um, Rewatching it now, I like it even more. So this is my third time, and I think... I, th I think it deserves an entire re reevaluation. Um, it, it obviously did not make um, um, you know much money at all. Not a lot of people know about this movie, but I highly suggest people go check it out on Netflix. Like now, come back, listen to the episode because <laughs> it, it it's special. I think it's one of the better ones on Netflix. I think I think I've overlooked it all these years that I've that you know that I've seen it and I just haven't got given it the respect. But uh, that, that's that's what the podcast is for, right? Yeah, exactly. We uh, reevaluate re things. And that's what we do here. Uh, so it was my it was my third time seeing it. I like it even more now. Uh, what about you? Is this your second time? This was my second time. I watched this on okay. a whim about two years ago. Uh, actually, about three years ago. And I liked it a lot. I thought it was a very smart movie. I thought that it didn't treat the audience like morons. It kind of told you just the right amount of information you needed to know. Yeah. And uh, in the end, I felt like, it was open for a sequel, but I'm kind of glad we didn't get one because it leaves, you know, what makes you think like, what, you know, what next? And Adam Wingard, I've seen a lot of his movies now and he is so good at not giving a fuck about the audience's expectations. He just yes. makes the story that he thinks the film needs to be and he kills it almost every time. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I, I thought this was great. Uh, honestly, Honestly, between the two viewings, I had totally forgotten about the second half of the movie. Like, I'd forgotten, like, what, what is he doing there? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just got kind of lost. Yeah, yeah. But then I was it like, he started coming back to me, and I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, he's Captain America, but he got fucked up. 
So yeah, I I thought it was really cool. I thought I I like this movie a lot, and I do urge more people to check it out. Um, the guest was directed by horror up and comer Adam Wingard, a graduate of notable film school Full Sail University, Caleb's alma mater, by the way. Uh, Wingard also directed the the films You're Next, VHS, VHS Two, The ABCs of Death, Blair Witch, Death Note. And he's set to direct Godzilla vs. Kong and an American remake of I Saw the Devil. So he is a big name in horror right now. I mean, to get Godzilla vs. Yes. Kong, that's, that's pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. But that, that's something that's Hollywood is trusting you. <laughs> yeah. He could be the first guy to act, actually like, do a good job with the human side of a Godzilla story. Yes. Because he's really good at writing uh, realistic characters. Uh, VHS and like VHS two, the first two of those films are fucked up. Those are creepy ass movies. Yeah. And his, yeah. Blair Witch, I didn't really like that much, but again, I didn't like the first Blair Witch the first time I saw it. And then I watched it recently for the show and I thought this was fucking awesome. So maybe it's all about, you know, the environment in which you watch the movie. A lot of, yes. Yeah. So we'll see, you know, if we draw that from the book, then we'll get to see that again. Yes. The film stars Dan Stevens as David, mysterious soldier with a dark secret. Stevens is known for his role as Matthew Crawley on Downton Abbey and for playing the Beast in Disney's live-action Beauty and the Beast remake. He also recently appeared in Netflix's comedy Eurovision Song Contest, The Story of Fire Saga. So he's, he, he's great in this. Dan Stevens does a great job of just pure stoicism, just you know, a soldier with one thing on his mind. He's basically a Terminator in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we talked, about, we talked about TV a little bit ago and how I'm kind of tough on it. But one show that I did watch because Noah Hawley created it is Legion. And Dan Stevens is um, the main character in that. He's, he, he, like, elevates what he's doing in The Guest. Like in, he, like, kind of carries that into that movie or to, into that show, sorry, a little bit. Uh, I find him to be someone that, that someone that needs a, a career kind of like jolt. Yes. Yeah. Because, because th- this guy is like oozing with talent. I, I believe. Yeah. Um, just needs, just needs the right role to kind of show everybody uh, film wise. Uh, I think he needs the right role to show everybody what he's capable of. Cause yeah, I, I love him in this sort of role. Almost like an evil captain America. Fucking awesome. You know what? He, I was thinking last night, I, me and my parents were talking about Batman for some reason, and I thought this guy would be... Well, make why wouldn't you talk about Batman? Because yeah, it's fucking, course. you know? It's Batman. He's, you know, one of the cooler, you know, superheroes of all time. Yeah. I talk about Batman roughly three, four times a day, <laughs> regardless of what I'm doing that day. Those it are rookie numbers. You need, to, you need to bump those up. Those are rookie numbers. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Very nice. Well, anyway, mm-hmm. I was... Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell <laughs> let's do that movie at some point on yes here. Fuck, absolutely fuck. dude talking about that's gonna be unbelievable wolf of wall yeah. street for you for you uh less learned listeners <laughs> mm-hmm. classic yeah. great movie yeah fucking hell. we were talking about that have earlier some, today weird yeah have some lobster while you go home to your miserable wives <laughs> <laughs> great movie wonderful uh, I forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> Dan, Dan Stevens, uh, Batman. Dan yeah. Stevens, yeah. <laughs> well, I was thinking he would make such a great Two Face. Like he's got that, you know, every man kind of like you know noble DA side, but he's also got that sick twisted side that he'd need like for Two Face. I think he would be great at that. Like someone needs to I call like up. Someone needs to call Matt Reeves and <laughs> talk and tell him about that. Yeah, man, that's that's a good call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't get why he's kind of like he was. It looked like he was heading up, and then he just kind of is stuck on this plateau. Like he never really he hasn't gone further than that. I don't know what happened. Yeah, well, hopefully in the next you know two three years we'll see something kind of kind of happen in his career for like for yeah. him. You know, because I feel like he's done a lot of stuff that's like him reaching out and trying to challenge himself. And now now I feel like you know he needs something that's gonna kind of kind of give him a break. You know what I mean? For sure. I, th- I would have thought uh, Beauty and the Beast would have been that. I mean, that was a huge success. Yeah. He yeah. was pretty good in it. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't get it. Maybe he pissed off a producer or something. I don't know. Yeah. 
<laughs> that can that can happen. That can fuck up your entire career career projection. Oh, Hollywood. <laughs> uh, Micah Monroe plays Anna Peterson, 20-year-old high school student who grows suspicious of David. Monroe has also appeared in such films as It Follows, The Bling Ring, Honey Boy, and Independence Day Resurgence. And I do not remember her at all. She's a very forgettable face. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 no, I don't recall much of these roles. I do love The Bling Ring. It's a great movie. But yeah, I don't, I don't recall much of uh, her work. Independence Day Resurgence was shit. And uh, It Follows was really good, but also yes. I've kind of forgotten a lot of it. It's been a while. That's, that's another one we'll, we'll definitely, uh, I think, deserves, for me anyway, and I think it sounds like for you, deserves an, a reevaluation for sure. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I gave it an eight when I watched it. I liked it, but it's been a while, and I do not remember why I liked it. Yeah, yeah, I definitely feel the same way. And I, I hear people that I respect in the you know movie world say, Oh, the movie's great. And I'm like, yeah, I remember liking it too, but I don't, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> well, I was thinking earlier about uh, watching films. And for me, I think that the most important watch is the second watch. You need to watch a movie at least twice to really get the full flavor. Yes. And uh, yeah, I typically don't do that. So I might have to start doing that. Um. Brendan Meyer plays Luke Peterson, younger brother who bonds with David because he has no friends. Meyer appeared in the series The OA and the H.P. Lovecraft sci-fi th thriller Color Out of Space. And uh, that was a weird movie. <laughs> we got to do that on the show just to unpack it. Color Out yes, of Space. yes, please. Yes. <laughs> that was such a fucked up. I was, I was bored for most of it, but Nick Cage, just every scene he's in is gold because he's Nick Cage. The guy's just... Got this magnetism. I don't. I can't explain. It's gravita. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sheila Kelly plays Laura Peterson, the mom who lets David stay with them. Kelly has appeared in such films as Matchstick Men. Speaking of Cage, Singles, and he. Um, she had recurring roles on Lost and The Good Doctor. Uh, Matchstick Men, such a fucking classic. I, I remember she was Zoe in the last season of Lost, like Charles yes. Widmore's secretary lady who was like a geologist. I don't remember. It's been a while. Um, Leland Orser plays Spencer Peterson, the alcoholic father. Orser has appeared in a ton of random films, notably Seven, Alien Resurrection, The Bone Collector, Saving Private Ryan, Daredevil, and Taken. He is all over the map. He's been one of those guys just you know playing bit parts forever. Oh yeah, I'd say he's a, a first ballot Hall of Famer in the one of those guys, you know, Hall of Fame. Yeah. Honestly, I've known about this guy for my like most of my life. This is the first time I've ever learned his name. <laughs> Leland I, Orser. Try to hold I'm, that. I'm no, I hope I forget it so he can stay in the Hall of Fame of one of those guys. So once you know their name, they're no longer in that Hall of Fame. <laughs> yes, the uh, the perfect example of this would be um, from age. For me, from, I would say, age, I don't know, 10 or so when I was, like, watching Scrubs um, up until probably 20, I would always forget John C. McKinsley, uh, his name, John C. McKinley. And he was the king of those guys, and now he's not. And I don't want our boy here, Leland, to get to that place. I want him to stay as one of those guys. <laughs> uh, for me, I have a problem. Like, whenever I learn an actor's name, it tends to stick. Like, so I don't really have a Hall of Fame for me. Now now it's definitely going to stick because we've had this conversation. You know, I would say right now, I, it was hard for me to even point out those guys. It's more when I was younger. Um, yeah. And John C. McKinley is the perfect example. I, I would say, I would say when I was really young, like John Carroll Lynch is one of those guys. You're like, man, that guy just pops up randomly. Who is that? Yeah. And then you get, you get older and you're like, Oh, he's, he's a fucking legend. Yeah. For me, it was, uh, it was William Fickner. They're, they're uh, great example. Great example. Bruce Dern. Great example. <laughs> um, J.K. Simmons for a while. Yeah, yeah, especially with the commercials and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it just he, – he still is so hard to get him out of Jameson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> still. Well, thankfully, we're not going to have to get him out of Jameson because he's going to be Jameson for quite a while. <laughs> truly, truly. Thank God. Uh, speaking of Leland Orser – do you remember his scene in Seven? Uh, of course, Seven's a movie that will will um, 
when we draw that, that'll be like a great day. Oh yeah. <laughs> God damn that. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many uncomfortable moments in that movie, but that that's on a different level. Just, that's that's a that's a movie you talk about your second viewing. You know, you watch it the first time and it has that shock value. Then you watch it a second time and you're kind of waiting for that stuff and you're 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 really appreciating the ins and the outs of kind of David Fincher's, you know, mastermind, oh, his his direction. The production uh, design, the cinematography, that film yeah, is beautiful. Yeah, all you're starting to appreciate all that stuff. And um I mean I love all of Fincher's work, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I um seven is not in my like upper echelon but i i still fucking love it <laughs> oi uh then we have lance reddick as major carver the soldier in charge of david's secret op reddick has appeared in such films as white house down jonah yes. hex angel has fallen and the john wick franchise as karen the concierge of the continental and that is what he will be known for forever <laughs> the guy who works the desk at the continental <laughs> yeah what a great what a great role to be remembered for. Oh hell yeah. That that franchise came out of fucking nowhere and it's become one of my favorites. It's just, guess what guess what year John Wick came out? 2014. Yeah. <laughs> that year, man. God damn. It's insane. It was all yeah, all over the place. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, John Wick is a film I would really love to do on the show. Because it was yeah. such a shock. It was such a surprise. It was just like you know, Keanu Reeves is doing an action movie. Oh, great. I guess I'll see it. I got nothing else happening. And then I'm like, this is the best movie I've seen in years. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, I definitely remember the first time I saw it. And I was like, almost, I almost thought it was a joke. I was like, there's no way this is happening. Like, <laughs> that there's a coherent, good, like quality action movie happening in front of me. There's no way this is happening. And then this, and then I watched it again, and I was like, "No, this happened. <laughs> <laughs> that happened." I had to kind of pinch myself, to be honest with you. The first time I watched that, I, 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 it was hard for me to even process that a good action movie like that was being made. You know, it really because it's just it's it's there's few and far between. I'm at these days. <laughs> yeah, man. And it's action, so action like, tough. It's so simple. It's just assassin out of the game gets his car stolen and his dog killed, and gets even. That's it. And that Revenge. created this franchise of just an immeasurable domino effect that affected the whole goddamn underground of global crime. And two and three are just as good. It's insane. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. It's become one of the like, better complete trilogies uh, uh, like ever. Leave it to stunt guys to know how to do a good action movie. <laughs> ah, the guest has an IMDb score of 6.7. Rotten Tomatoes score of 91%. It was a bomb, regrettably, grossing only 2.7 mil on a budget of 5 million. But I think it's on its way to finding new life as a cult hit. I think Netflix has been a big help with that. It's been on Netflix for so long. Its whole, like, its whole run has been Netflix. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And with that, I guess let's get into the plot of this thing. Let's do it. So we open with... A family struggling with the loss of their oldest son, Caleb, uh, who died in Afghanistan. The Peterson family, their remaining children, Luke and Anna, are visited by David Collins, a f uh, former soldier who claims that he was Caleb's friend. He, he was with him when he died. And with his dying breath, Caleb told David to check on his family and see if they needed anything. And David's polite. He's friendly. He's a little, a little robotic, but he's a soldier, so they just kind of shrug it off. And Mrs. Peterson offers to let him stay as long as he needs to because he's, he was familiar with their son. The way he manipulates this family is fucking brilliant because he, he never says much. It's always their idea. He's the perfect sociopath. And I love – you get that. Like, all they have to tell you so that you know he's insane – is when he goes into Caleb's bedroom and just sits on the bed and stares at it out the window. Doesn't say anything, just stares. And he barely blinks either. Like, it's fucking crazy. Yeah, I, I, I would like to bring up that, you know, it, it's, it's filmed in New Mexico, so you have these, these really kind of, I, I don't, almost ominous shots in the middle of the day where it's so unclear. If you needed help, where would you go? 
Yeah, it's very <laughs> much in a bubble. It's All, crazy. Like, like, like right away, you, you, you feel, and I, I felt this way at times in Texas, not so much in the houses that I've lived in, but um, just places I've visited and, and family that I have. Uh, I have family that lives in post Texas where it's, you know, very, the houses are very far apart from each other. And it feels that way in the guest where you're right away, just kind of isolated and you have, you kind of have no choice. Cause like you said, he puts the ball into their court right away. Yeah. Well, and he's, I mean, all he says is, yeah, I, I knew your son. I mean, they know nothing about this guy. They know, they don't know who he is. They don't know what he's like. They just, yeah. but they're so wounded by Caleb's death that they're just like, yeah, stay with us. And he takes full advantage of that. But we don't really know why ever. Like, why is he here? And I had to kind of piece it together this time, but it really, I do think it is just, he is programmed to see everything through. No matter how small, no matter how stupid, if he is told to do something, he's going to do it. It doesn't matter. So he told Caleb, I will find your family and I will make sure they're okay. And that's why he's here. He's risking fucking everything to be here. But he's there. And he really does try to help them in his own twisted way. Yeah. It's, it's bonkers. <laughs> oh. So while he's staying with the family, David hears about Mr. Peterson's troubles at work. His, uh, some younger kid with a degree got the management job he wanted and he's pissed. Uh, Luke has a black eye. He gets bullied by these jock assholes at school. Uh, <laughs> that was crazy. First off that, uh, Mrs. Peterson just lets David pick up her kid from school. <laughs> Known him for like a fucking day. And is like, can you go? Pick it it is, son? it is, it is here in the guest. And another thing I'll point out that I read, um, is, uh, this movie, it's initial, rough cut has an additional almost 30 minutes of stuff and apparently explained that that kind of stuff more like kind of gave it a little more background into like them trusting him yeah but that's that sucks man because apparently people um responded to it ne negatively responded to it you know on its first screening and so they yeah. cut a lot of it which happens with, which happens with horror all the time but it, it, man that sucks so bad because I, I that's like one of my only complaints about the movie is like the logistics of okay, really? <laughs> are, are, we, are we really going to just let this guy take his place, essentially? Take Caleb's place? And like, yeah, that, that, seems, that seems a little far-fetched. But hey, you know, it's, it's a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. Kind of. I, don't, I honestly don't know if I would label this as horror. It, that's something we need to talk about. Yeah. We'll bring that up later on it's a it's a it's a genre bender for sure yes absolutely um well david is immediately saying you know sees luke's black eye he knows what's going on so when he picks him up he's like all right i want you to point out who punched you and luke's like what do you mean i i fell and david's like come on <laughs> don't bullshit a bullshitter <laughs> and so luke's is like all right it was those assholes and david's like okay so he follows them to a bar. Sweet. Which, which, uh, how do you feel at that moment? You're like, oh, these jocks, they're about to get it. Oh, he's going to fuck them up. And it's satisfying as hell. Yes. Because <laughs> at this point in the film, you're, you're, you like David. You don't really know what's up with him, but you like him. Everybody likes David. He's the perfect person. Like, he's programmed to, to you know, do everything. He really is Captain America if Captain yeah. America was fucking nuts. <laughs> It's cool. Unhinged. Unhinged yeah, unhinged Steve Rogers. Yeah. Straight up. <laughs> and uh, he, go, he follows these kids to a bar that don't, uh, the bar doesn't card. So when the bartender tells Luke, like, you got to go, David's like, did you card those kids? The bartender's like, oh, all right, what can I get you? <laughs> Just, nope, no, no argument there. <laughs> and, 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 you know, f fair play. Uh, th there are plenty of, Plenty of people who sell alcohol to uh, to minors, but I'm not not quite sure if they would sell to minors and then allow them to continue wearing their high school football jersey in that building that they sold them the alcohol in. That <laughs> that doesn't quite add up. Now, now 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 I totally would understand a guy being like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll take an extra twenty 
and, you know, go to the gas station and give it to them, right? And they, you know, they, uh, they go home and party. But at your bar, <laughs> you're putting yourself at so much risk. <laughs> if, if, if any, um, yeah, uh, authority walks in, you know, any police or whatever it may be, walk in, you're, you're, you're so fucked. I mean, these guys are wearing their high school football jerseys. I never really got that part. I was like, I, I get it. I'm not, I'm not naive to the, to the fact that minors gets, you know, get sold alcohol all the time, but in that, in that fashion, I'm not sure. Well, they're all a bunch of fucking idiots anyway. I don't think they even notice they've got it on. I mean, this is, you know, their daily routine here. <laughs> <laughs> this 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 country bumpkin town they just don't know what's what oh yeah hey but then he does that and the bartender has the balls to tell luke you can't come in here you're a minor yes <laughs> like who, who what are they sucking your dick what's going on man what's going uh, on here this bar yeah. is weird <laughs> yeah straight up and uh, David decides to have to play with these kids. Uh, first off, he orders himself a fucking fireball. Yeah, which just sounds like the most disgusting drink. Just, I mean, cinnamon schnapps and Tabasco. That's that's a good. That's a fun drink to people. No, it's yeah. not. I've tried it. It's not. It's terrible. Oh. It's stupid. My Why uncle you drinks do this to yourself. He drinks fireballs sometimes, and I don't fucking get it. Yeah, no, I've done it. Threw up immediately. Hated it. Felt like I needed to eat immediately and drink a bunch of water because it just needed anything to get that taste out of my mouth is how I felt. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you're drinking fucking liquid fire. Like, how is that fun? But yeah. 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 David seems like the kind of, you know, hardened son of a bitch who would drink that and enjoy it. <laughs> and you don't question it. So then he says, You see those boys over there? I want to order them drinks. <laughs> and he says he was gonna. He wants Cosmos for the guys and blowjob shots for the girls. <laughs> oh, and the bartender's like, "Are you really? <laughs> You're gonna do that? Okay." <laughs> he knows what's going on, but David keeps giving him money, and he's just like, "Fuck it, not my fight." All right, <laughs> and <laughs> the bartender brings over the drinks. The guys are like walking over with their you know alpha male stride. Holding the Cosmos, <laughs> like you buy his drinks. It's like, yeah. <laughs> well, you can keep it. And one guy chucks the Cosmo in David's face. David wipes it off. Luke is fucking terrified. <laughs> and David then hurls the fireball in the kid's face. <laughs> and yeah, I imagine that would hurt a lot more than a Cosmo to the face. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Then David kicks all of their asses single handedly. And tips the bartender again and says, you didn't see me. You didn't see the kid. And, you know, just let this, you know, forget this ever happened or else you're going to have some trouble with these minors. And just walks away. And Luke is now fucking indebted to David and thinks he's the coolest motherfucker who ever walked the planet. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he does. And, and this is when he uses that kind of uh, manipulation tactic to – Hey, I, I'm I'm doing what your brother, you know, can't do right now because he because he's not with us anymore, and I'm I'm gonna like protect you. I'm gonna be like your hero here. So of course this guy's like, yeah, I'm I want him to be on my side because I can kick anybody's ass if I if he's on my side. Yeah. So I get I get his kind of like almost infatuation with him. You know, he's like I I want to be friends with him. Yeah, straight up, he wants to be everybody in this family's best friend, and he does a great job of that. But uh, Anna is skeptical. She doesn't trust him. She doesn't know why he's here. She doesn't. She thinks he's hot, but that's about it. And uh, her her mom makes him makes her invite David to a party she's going to. And David goes with her, and hangs out, smokes some weed, uh, meets Craig, this goofy guy who sells him a gun later. And uh, her friend Kristen immediately thinks David is fucking chiseled from marble. And he's the you know, hottest man on earth. And uh, after he saves her from his ex-boyfriend, which was fucking hilarious, because the guy's this, like, you know, burly jo jock who's like, what's up? You're not recurring, turning my phone calls, bitch. And David's like, watch it. And then just body chucks him into a, into a picture on the, on the wall and tells his friend, get him the fuck out of here. And Kristen's yeah, like, yeah. oh, boy. <laughs> 
Oh, so they fuck. As would be yeah. the next logical step to that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and um, Luke then, I mean, uh, David then comes out and uh, hangs out with Anna and, and uh, her friend Craig. And when Anna walks away, Craig and him are talking and David just casually goes, can you sell me a gun? And Craig's like, fuck yeah, I'll sell you a gun. <laughs> you got cash? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're cool as shit, man. Yeah. <laughs> You just walked in here, beat the guy's ass, and got laid. That guy's cool, yeah. And uh, at this party, Anna has a fight with her boyfriend who's going to go on tour with his band. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That guy is something else. <laughs> oh, man, have I known some of those guys. <laughs> What's his name, Zeke? Yeah. Oh, my band is playing here tonight. You, you should check us out. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay zeke oh my god yeah um so she's pissed because she's not cool with this and he's like babe this is my career <laughs> yeah it's riding on the it's riding on this show he's in his own movie zeke <laughs> <laughs> he really is he's in his own like shitty 80s movie yeah <laughs> only one show uh, one opportunity to give it Everything. We're gonna be huge. <laughs> uh God damn. It's just it's just two brothers. <laughs> so Anna's pissed and tells David, like, can we go? And they go. And on the way home, David just like want to talk about it. And it's like, no. And then it's like, it's just and yeah, of course she's gonna talk about it. He's talkable. He's talkable. And she says, you know, he said he was done with this. And why am I why am I not enough? And he's like, if I was, you know, if you were my girl, like, I, you know, I'd treat you like the angel you are. And she's like, huh, thanks. So they're bonding. And he likes the music that she's got on. And she says she'll make him a mix. And he's kind of excited about that. Ah, oh, cool. A burnt CD. <laughs> 2014. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? I, I shouldn't. I mean, I still fucking burn CDs. <laughs> No, I I definitely do, but this is that's not something you put in a movie. That's that's something that yeah, like people you know, you know. Yeah, the mixtape is a, dead. <laughs> it's 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 a rare art form these days, burning CDs. Yeah, yeah. I still do a Halloween mix every year. I still yeah, I still have your, the one from 2019. I think it's great. You know, I I ha I still have um ones I did from like when I was a kid, and I you know did like. CDs of uh, uh, of bands, and I would pick ten songs, like my ten, and it was a way for me to pick a top ten from each band. So I'd be like top ten Pearl Jam songs and Red Hot Chili Peppers and all those bands, you know, that I was like in love with in middle school and early high school. And yeah, I'll, I still I still have those. I'll never I'll never leave those. You know, I'll never you know I'll get rid of those. That's awesome. Uh, the music though, by the way, is all very carpenter-esque the music is uh all synthesizers and just like steady beats and tense as hell uh very big on crafting the atmosphere in this movie uh yeah for sure for sure david decides to teach luke some self-defense so he can take care of himself gives him a butterfly knife when they're carving pumpkins <laughs> david's like oh this knife's too dull pulls a fucking butterfly knife out of his back pocket and just switches it around so he's carving this pumpkin and luke's like are you kidding me you are so awesome. <laughs> David's like, here, take it. I got more, which yeah. should be a concerning thing to hear. But yeah, I got backups. <laughs> yeah, duh. Luke's like, oh my God, cool. I'm never washing this hand again. He's like fawning over David. <laughs> uh, at that point, I think uh, Spencer, the dad, comes in and says that his uh, new boss was killed. And that yes. makes him the new boss. He's, you know, he's freaked out, but he's like, you know, I'm the new manager. Be careful what you wish for. Hell of a way to get promoted. And, uh, <laughs> and I love how he's like subtly, you know, ah, oh, I could use a drink every fucking scene, you know, he's in. Well, to be fair, he's having a rough go of it. I mean, his son is. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Strangers become a family friend. His boss was, you know, killed and now he's the boss. It's been a. It's it's been a, it's been a moment. <laughs> well, it's it's just it's just a great way for it's a great trope to use for him as like the 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 father of the family, 
where this like sociopath is living um when he is home his mind is altered so he's not quite paying attention or totally there and understanding the stakes of what's happening and oh my god this guy's crazy you know yeah because he's he's slightly distracted the entire time he's home dad's drunk mom is grieving the son is lonely it means the daughter's the only one with a clear head here and she does have her suspicions and she carries through on that and starts a fucking shit show that gets a lot of people killed yes um, so uh <clears throat> anna overhears david talking to some kind of plastic surgeon saying he needs a new face and fingerprints and he's going to pay top dollar <laughs> and it's like huh i should probably look into that that's a weird thing to over here so she uh calls a military base to ask about david and this alerts a private corporation headed by major carver who considers this to be very important and assembles a team of special forces to go find david and they're all like the, you know, the subjects all should have died. What the hell is this? You know, we thought he was dead. We got to get him immediately. So right now I'm like, shit, <laughs> who is this guy? And uh, Anna is now this, terrified. Yeah, this just all of a sudden turned into like a spy, like a esp- espionage thriller with, you know, some, some horror in it. Yeah, it becomes a crazy movie. For sure. And uh, David goes out to buy the guns from Craig and uh, some other guy. And tests the weapons and is like, I'll take them. And they're like, oh, cool. How much? And he's like, all of them. I'll take all your guns. And they're like, wow, have you got a coin? Yeah. Come on. And he's like, no, no, I think I'll just kill you. <laughs> and they're like, what? And Craig's like, come on, man. Don't be like that. And David shoots the other guy in the, in the head. Craig takes off. He <laughs> puts more bullets in the gun and then shoots him from very far away. Takes all these guns and a couple live grenades. Yes. <laughs> Um, Epic big, scene Yeah awesome That's where you finally realize who this guy is And what he's capable of uh, Something that I've always been really into uh, In movies uh, Some of my favorite parts of like the, uh, the, Bourne, the Bourne movies Would be when the main character Is either cleaning Or fixing Or taking apart a gun Yeah, and it's, it's such a fascinating thing to film Because it requires um, and I, I've never, I, you know, I've, I've, sh- I've gone to the, you know, a gun range and shot some, shot some good different guns. Cause I have some friends who are into them and hunt and whatnot, but I, I don't know much about them at all. And it requires very quick hands. And so it's, it's such a fascinating thing to watch on camera. And Dan Stevens is already like, he's got his watch on, he's got his little slick to the side haircut and his, his you know, he just looks perfect. Just bah, 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 bah. And so when he puts it all together, and then, you know, yeah, just lines that shit up. It, it's, you know, it's all going to work and you know, he's going to shoot him first try. Cause you know, this is, this is a movie, but all <laughs> of, the, all of that buildup is, is like pretty genius stuff. And, and th- that's the stuff in the guest that I all, I'll remember most uh, this time watching it is, is the kind of the, the, the atmosphere and those moments of like pure anticipation. Uh, it's so, so beautiful. It's great. I'll I'll remember the um I really like the the moments of small comedy in this. For sure, for like sure. When David gets out of the shower and runs into Anna and she's like, "Oh, uh, sorry." And he's like, "Oh, no problem. I guess I should go get dressed." Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. Walks away and he's she's like, "Whew." <laughs> yeah, he's great. I love I love his I love his awareness of yeah, just how like attractive he is. I, I think that's I think that's hilarious. He uses it as a as a weapon to manipulate her because that's what he does. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So the base calls Anna back and tells her that David Collins died a week ago in a fire. <laughs> Anna is does not know what to do with that information. Spooky. And then she soon finds out Craig has been killed and her boyfriend Zeke has been arrested for it. And. I love that he calls her and is like, yeah, they found some things in my apartment, so I'm going to be here for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then Anna's, the dad is just like, well, yeah, he deserves it because he's a piece of shit. And you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. And she didn't tell him that they were still dating, and she, like, raises his voice, and he's like, do not talk that way to me, young lady. She's 20, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ugh, okay. Cut the fucking cord, man. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, so Anna then decides to say, you know, hey, who the hell is he? You don't know anything about him. David Collins is dead. <clears throat> who the fuck are you? And David's like, ooh, yeah. Like, he already has his answer prepped. He's like, yeah, uh, they, you know, I'm, they would tell you that cover story. I'm not you know, supposed to be here. You're not supposed to talk about it. But here's my dog tags. And Spencer's like, well, that is perfectly reasonable. You owe him an explanation. You owe him an apology, young lady. And she's like, fuck you, and walks out. Incredible. <laughs> but now David knows he's got a problem. And he goes to talk to Anna and is like, I'm glad we could put this behind us. So, you know, good night. <laughs> and the camera pans over. And he's not sleeping. He never fucking sleeps. He just sits there quietly. <laughs> yeah, just waits. Recharge. Yep. Oof. <laughs> so Anna sneaks uh she sneaks David's phone, takes a picture of the numbers that he's been calling, and has her and has Luke do some research and tells him everything. And Luke's like, No way, not David. He's too cool to be crazy. <laughs> he's not doing anything. And uh uh at school, Luke, who's looking all this up gets attacked by one of the kids who's got a fucking brace on his neck. He calls Luke a, uh, quote, faggot. And Luke... Uh, that, that, that... I completely forgot about that, right? That in the middle of the movie, it's, it's, it's a, you know, excuse us both, but it is a, um, like a, hey, faggot. It's one of those, like, very aggressive... And yeah. Where you're kind of like, you're kind of taken aback and you forget that, Ah, that's kind of touchy to put in just any movie unless it has some context. And it does here for sure. Exactly. And, and, and so uh, <laughs> Brianna and I were watching it last night after he said that both of us were like, get him fucker. <laughs> Beat the shit out of him. You know, like, <laughs> fucking, how stupid is this guy? I mean, he just got his ass kicked by some yeah. serious special forces dude. And now he's going back for more. <laughs> and calling kids the F word. So yeah, beat his ass. You know, that's how we felt. Yeah. Zero hesitation with Luke. He just gets up and punches the guy. Yeah. And the guy like grabs him. Luke grabs a yardstick and fucks the guy up. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. V- very fantastic. Reminding me of, um, there's a scene uh, there in Moonlight when our boy yeah, Chiron. The chair. Yeah. Our boy Chiron gets his, gets his revenge, you know, on that, that douchey bully. Oh, you know, really, really wails on him, you know, and you're just like, yeah, part of you is like, ah, violence isn't, you know, <laughs> isn't great. But, man, you just can't stand bullies, you know? Some people need it. Some people need it. Bullies suck, yeah, you know? Especially, you know, yeah, they're terrible. Sometimes people need to be checked. <laughs> and, yeah, I agree. Especially especially the people who think they're the checkers, yeah. Oh, yeah, fuck them up. Fuck them all up. <laughs> fuck them good. Yeah, get yardsticks and chairs and beat the shit out of these assholes. <laughs> yardsticks. <laughs> uh, so... They both end up at the principal's office, and the principal is going to expel Luke. And there's no, they don't look into the situation. They don't nope. look, they've never been watching Luke. They don't give a fuck that he's been bullied this whole time and finally stood up for himself. All they know is he hit a kid. They have a zero tolerance on fighting. Luke's out the door. Yeah. David comes to the parent-teacher conference with Mrs. Peterson. Apparently, they can't be bothered to fucking parent anymore. And, uh, he set, brings up like so what did the why were they fighting and the principal's like that's not relevant and David's like oh it, it is so why did why did Luke hit him what did he call him and the principal's like well uh, <laughs> there was a certain slur used and David's like well that makes it a hate crime and the principal's like whoa 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 hate crime it's like yeah you got a gay student standing up for himself and you're going to expel that student oh we're going to sue your ass off <laughs> the principal's like, oh, hey, hey, how about a week's, how about a, a month's attention, huh? And David's like, okay, but if this kid's ever harassed, I'm coming for your ass. <laughs> it's awesome. And Mrs. Peterson's like, oh my God, my guardian angel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is, which is great, right? Yeah. And, and Luke's like, holy shit, you got me off with just that? Well, in return, I will let you know that my sister is looking into you. Fuck. <laughs> Damn it, Luke. Pick, your, pick the right side, man. Loyalty, man. Oh. But 
and it kind of makes sense that he'd be loyal to David after all he's done for him, but they've known this guy, what, a week? <laughs> God damn. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Luke's like, yeah, I know you killed uh, my dad's boss, and I know you killed Craig, but I don't care because we're friends. Jesus. I, dude, we're, we're good friends, but if you ever killed anybody, I'd, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> oh yeah no for sure i would i would hope that i would never ever appear on this podcast again if i killed somebody and i've known you a lot longer than a week <laughs> yeah yeah i don't just that kid is so lonely like this is he's never had any like positive enforcement from anybody but this this soldier guy is like hey you know i'm gonna help you out and he's like all right well you're my best friend forever so now David knows everything. He knows that they know that he committed murder and that Anna's onto him. So now he's got to fuck shit up. Now he's got to take care of business. Uh, he, tells, he tells him that Anna might have told Kristen about this. So now David has to help, you know, take care of that. And while David's helping Mrs. Peterson with the laundry, Major Carver shows up with a team of special ops guys, tries to kill David and just blow the house away not subtle at fucking all they're just like there he is and they rip this place to shreds mrs peterson is terrified understandably and is like what the hell is going on and david's like hey i haven't told you guys everything uh turns out there's a lot you don't know about me and mrs peterson's like do you ever actually know my son he's like yes i did and i promised him i would check in with you people so i did that's what the mission and i'm very sorry about this she yells for help. He stabs her in the stomach. Kills Mrs. Peterson. He drives away, crashes into Mr. Peterson's car deliberately, puts a bullet in his chest. So he's now killed Anna and Luke's parents. Yes. He's taking care of anybody who ever saw him in this town. Anybody who could know anything about anything because they are loose ends, and he is programmed to tie up loose ends. Major Carver picks up Anna and informs her that her parents are dead and David is actually a former test subject for a military health program and his mental condition has been programmed to kill everyone who could possibly know about his identity if it gets compromised. Damn. How, not a good idea to make that kind of person. <laughs> no, 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 no. Especially some uh, that looks so real. Yeah. God, I feel like this, you know, they do... They, they do these ex kind of experiments all the fucking time, trying to make the, you know, the quote unquote super soldier. And uh, this is a pretty damn realistic depiction of what would happen if one of these guys was crazy. <laughs> I'm Mr. Me Seeks. <laughs> yeah, basically he fucking is, isn't he? <laughs> he's got to take care of everything. Oh my God, he's a fucking Me Seeks. <laughs> Look at me. What about your short game, Jerry? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that episode. Oh, it's um, <laughs> me seeks and destroys. Well, he roped me into this. What about him? He roped me into this. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> what about him? We're not supposed to exist this long. It's getting weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I never, I'm going to think about this movie as he's a fucking me seeks forever now. <laughs> Yes. God damn. <laughs> so David is now on a mission to TCB, take care of business. He goes to the restaurant, shoots Kristen, and blows the place up. <laughs> he just drops two grenades and is like, sorry about this. Throws him into the restaurant and walks out quietly. <laughs> he then heads to the school to kick, take care of Luke, who's uh, helping fix up the Halloween dance. And uh, Carver and Anna head for the school. And the school is set up in an elaborate haunted house maze. And I got to say, fucking great work for a high school. <laughs> I mean, damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the level of a, you know, this is a production design of a horror, for like from a good horror movie. And it's, yeah, it's like a high school dance. Just amazing. It's so well made, like well constructed for a high school. I went to a haunted house my first semester at Texas State as a freshman and it was shit. This this high school has like a, not even a quarter of the budget of a college, but they make this super wonderful, elaborate haunted house maze. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it made me laugh. Uh, 
Carver and Anna are trying to get through it. And I love Carver's just like, military police, how the fuck do I get out of here? And the guy's like, left, right, right, left, left, right. It's just, I love that. <laughs> it's like, how do I, why is this here? <laughs> uh, they attempt to help Luke escape, and David announces his presence by playing Anna's mix CD on the DJ booth. Is, he is a soldier with a mission, but he's also a fucking horror movie monster. <laughs> Oof. Uh, they kill... Uh, she, he kills Luke's teacher, and he kills Carver when they try to exit the building. And uh, Anna gets the drop on David, shoots him with Carver's gun, but David stabs her in the leg and tries to choke her to death. Luke shows up, rescues her by stabbing, her, stabbing him in the back with his butterfly knife. And David's like, hey, you did the right thing. Never doubt that. And he seemingly dies. And uh, Luke and Anna are sitting in an ambulance outside the burning school. They overhear the conversation between the firefighters that they only found two corpses with their teeth pulled off. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> Anna witnesses a firefighter leave the building who's got a limp. <laughs> and they realize, oh shit, it's David. And then the movie's over. <laughs> you can't kill this motherfucker. They, they made him, yeah, superhuman. Exactly. <laughs> Brilliant way to set up a sequel or a brilliant way to end a good movie. Yeah, I I don't think there's anywhere really to go with this. I mean, he, I, I think he's just right there going to just kill them too. It's He won. He's going to get away. You can't kill this guy, clearly. But it is kind of nuts that they were able to get the drop on this highly trained super soldier. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they competed for sure. They tried their best. They did. So here are some film gas and facts. Number one. Steve Moore, who composed the score for the movie, used the same type of synthesizers that John Carpenter and Alan Howarth used for composing the score for Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. So not only is it an homage, they're made like with the same kind of music, uh, instruments. Sweet. Absolutely. So cool. You can tell. Number two, uh, we, covered, we talked a little bit about this. Dan Stevens doesn't really blink in his close-ups, and he did this to emphasize the unsettling nature of David or whoever this guy is. <laughs> and three, and this was very interesting. Some fans have suggested that David is actually Caleb. <laughs> this theory is not, you know, it's been disproven by the director, but <sighs> it's weird. The reasons are that it's been disproved is in one of the first scenes, David and, and Caleb are shown in a picture together, which proves they're not the same person. Although who's to say Caleb just didn't get that guy's face, like put on his like face off. Yeah, exactly. Number two, when David's attacked by Major Carver and his team, he admits to Laura that he really did know her son and that they were in the same program. However, he could be lying. <laughs> he is a sociopath. Yeah, just, he was lying a lot, yeah. And number three, despite what some people have said, David never admits or indicates that his face was altered. In the scene where David is on the phone with a plastic surgeon, he's talking about getting a new face and fingerprints. Some viewers often misunderstand this scene, think that David's actually talking about a plastic surgery he's already had. Which makes no sense because for the shootout starts, Major Carver shows a picture of David Delora and his face isn't different. So, I don't know. I mean, it is neat to think of this as it's Caleb who's lost his mind. Uh, I don't know. I guess we'll never really know. It's all about yeah. how you look at it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I personally give this an eight. I think it's a smart thriller. It keeps the audience guessing. And I think the third act is just fucking bonkers and entertaining. Um, yeah, I also, I also give it an eight for very similar reasons, you know, atmosphere, man, music, atmosphere, Dan Stevens, really creepy stuff he's doing on the screen. For sure. He's, uh, yeah, some of his best work. And I, as we talked about earlier, I really hope that he gets recognized for something. He needs a big yeah. role, a meaty role, something that's going to get him a lot of attention because he really does have the chops to be a great leading man. Yes, I agree. And that brings us to the spotlight. We talk about some of the films we've been watching outside the podcast. So I'm on vacation in Nags Head, North Carolina. So I haven't been doing any reviews lately, but I did just rewatch The Gentleman. Very nice. A fantastic, hilarious crime comedy that we regrettably never got to do on the show. Maybe one day. Uh, I love that movie to death. <laughs> the Gentleman, easily the best film I saw in 2020 before everything went tits up. Uh, but yeah, Matthew McConaughey, Charlie Hunnam, Colin Farrell. Uh, yeah, fantastic movie. Hugh Grant is hilarious. And it's just a film about 
you know, upper class English cr- criminals <laughs> and the weed game. And yeah. um, it's Guy Ritchie's like best work in years. And I highly recommend it. I gave it a nine on the website. That still holds true. One day it will be a 10. I know it. And uh, yeah, that is my spotlight. What have you been checking out? Hell yeah. I've been watching, watching a decent amount of stuff. Uh, last week, I believe I talked about The Player, which is a great movie. But uh, yeah, I have a, a movie that's a 2020 release that I would like to talk about. Two 2020 releases I'd like to talk about today. Okay. The first, the first one, uh, The Vast of Night. Second yeah. one, second one, You Should Have Left. Um, you Should Have Left, not good. <laughs> It's a shame. Uh, it's one of those horror efforts that doesn't quite know what it's trying to say and kind of predictable. And it's just something we've seen before. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, it's tough. Um, I, you know, check it out for yourself. If you, you might have a different interpretation of it. But that's how I felt. Kevin Bacon, Man of Seafried. They're trying to do their best with the, uh, the script, but it's just not that, that strong. However, The Vast of Night, directed by Andrew Patterson. Um, I gave a nine, just like you gave The Gentleman, which is a great movie. Gentleman's awesome. One of the better ones of the year, for sure. Uh, The Vast of Night is a very low-key movie. Andrew Patterson is not a very well-known writer or director, but this is kind of his, to me, what's going to kind of break through in the um, kind of sci-fi, you know, community. It's a film about really two characters, a the switchboard operator and a, a radio DJ in a small town in New Mexico um, in the 50s. And they experience, um, as they're in a small town, they're, they're using a lot of the same, you know, uh, radio waves, same frequency, right? Um, this switchboard operator and the radio DJ. So at the same time, they're experiencing some interesting sounds and it ends up being, um, you know, it's, it, it seems to them to be something es- extraterrestrial, right? And as this movie progresses, it just kind of, you know, its fundamentals are less is more and, and do those things that we have talked about so many times on Filmgasm, the practicality of not having a ton of money, using what you have to make a good, uh, creepy movie. Um, and that's what The Vast of Night does, man. It, it, the cinematography is, is breathtaking um, without making you feel like, yeah, it spent all this money because it didn't. It didn't have it. It's a small cast with a bunch of unknown people, and I couldn't recommend it more. Um, it's on Amazon Prime right now, and it is definitely my favorite movie of 2020 um, so far that I've seen. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's great, you know, that there's um, the positivity of, you know, movies like The Gentleman and The Vast of Night that you can still kind of point out and look at as strong 2020 films. Yeah, we didn't get much, but... We did get a small assortment of really decent movies. I also watched Birds of Prey again uh, today. Yeah, that one was pretty good. That one's decent, yeah. yeah. Better watch the second time around. Uh, yeah. Invisible Man was so good. Yeah, Onward yeah. was great. The Five it, Bloods. The Five Bloods was awesome. Yeah, man. Onward, yeah. Although, yeah, it's, 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 there's been some. There's been some. Yeah, just not enough. You just, you, and you got to keep your eyes open, too. I know uh, First Cow is available right now. Kelly Reichardt's film, which has great reviews. So, you know, just depending on what you like, you know, there's stuff out there. You just got to probably spend a little more money than you're used to to watch it at home. <laughs> Regrettably, yeah, you are going to have to do that. Um, but I did see that a lot of these films, like uh, You Should Have Left, for instance, are getting a DVD release pretty soon. Yeah. So I think I'll just wait for that. Yeah, there you go. That's nice. You have, then you have, yeah, if you have the, the physical copy, that's good. Yeah, and I don't have to pay for shit because I still do Netflix through the mail. Yeah, you, you should have left has, has some decent stuff atmosphere wise. There's some good shots, and the house, you know, is kind of like not what it seems that they're at, and it kind of like moves around and shifts. So there, there's cool aspects, but overall, you're, you're, it just doesn't hit, you know? It happens. That's a shame. Kevin Bacon's another one who hasn't had a good hit in a while. He's been doing it's a while. Yeah. It's been a minute. I heard he's uh, <laughs> being considered possibly for uh, Freddy Krueger. I could see it. Yeah, Robert Englund gave him uh, his blessing, which is pretty sweet. I didn't realize when I when I was watching the film, you should have left. I I didn't realize Kevin Bacon's sixty two. Shit, he looks great. Because I was looking up, I was trying to see how many years apart him and Amanda Seyfried are. I was like, man, this is like a because they're in a relationship in the film, and so that's like a thirty year. And then sure enough, she's thirty four and he's sixty two. <laughs> that's nuts. 
If you, uh, another thing, I, it's not a movie, but a, a TV show I recently watched that I cannot recommend enough. And it's already a huge hit on Netflix, Unsolved Mysteries. Yes. Uh, I, I, I breezed through all six of the current episodes of that show. Good Lord. The truth is so much scarier than fiction. The things people, like the things that happen to people, people just vanish. People get killed for no reason. People, you know, get away with murder way too fucking often. And it's just unsettling. And uh, yeah, I've been going through some of the older uh, seasons of that now. And uh, yeah, definitely recommend <laughs> Unsolved Mysteries for the, the horror buff out there. Yeah, yeah. I've watched the first episode and I will definitely be continuing that. It's, it's almost one of those things I don't want to go away. Um, you know, it's, it's like so good that you're like, ah, I want to save these episodes. Speaking of, speaking of something that's so good, um, I have not been able to play it yet, but I'm dying to because I've been watching some, some YouTube videos, some, some Twitch and whatnot of uh, The Last of Us 2. Yeah. That, that storyline looks like it is so good. The first game is so good and the ending is amazing, right? And did you play that game? The first I one? played. I played most of it. Uh, I didn't finish it. That's fair. But do you know the ending of it or no? I do not. Oh my god! Yeah, it's just brilliant. <laughs> it's brilliant storytelling, and I, I really want to play that. I was wondering if you had gotten the second game yet. Um, I haven't. I, yeah, I would, played a video game in years. Neither, neither do I, man. You know me. I have a baby, so I, I, it's very rare, and that's why I'm bringing it up because it's just very rare that I even talk about video games. But The Last of Us from what it looks like, it looks like a story. And I have something else to say about it. It looks like a story that I would like enjoy being immersed in. And I say that because there's been talks about it being made into a TV show. I heard, uh, yeah, HBO was going to do with it. With Josh Brolin playing Joel, the main character. So that would be pretty fucking badass. Yeah. Killer. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, we don't spotlight TV shows and video games often, but they are, you know, a great medium uh, with a lot of opportunities and a lot of really cool shit. And when we find that stuff, yeah, we'll bring it up. For sure. Yeah, we're not, we're not closed off to TV at all. I mean, yeah, you just talked about Unsolved Mysteries. It's, it's, TV is amazing. I mean, one of, my, one, of, you know, one of the coolest things you can do is make a great TV show, right? Like a Breaking Bad, when you can sustain for 60 episodes and keep, keep your fans interested and intrigued and proud of it the whole time. That's a feat that movies ha- don't have the capability of because there's so much less time. And I, I, part of me loves that kind of storytelling, but I, I just, I'm prone to watch more movies just because I can, I just, just by sheer time, you know, I can watch more yeah. movies within the, you know, with the time and, and a lot of TV, I feel like just kind of, you know, it'll be more of the same. It gets redundant. So you just got to yeah. be careful. I feel like you have to choose wisely with TV. TV shows are such a long-term investment that if it's not all great, you feel like you wasted your time sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, whereas movies, you're like, ah, whatever. It was an hour and a half. I'm, I, you know, I'm done with it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so ne- next week, we go back into the book of Filmgasm and yes. draw a quirky little horror comedy from last year, our first Hulu original, Little Monsters, starring Lupita Nyong'o as a music teacher trying to protect her students from a zombie outbreak on a field trip. I don't think either of us have seen it yet. Have you, have you seen this yet? No, but I've heard good things from very close friends, yeah. Right on. So we're in for a surprise. Uh, I heard good things about it as well. Until then, uh, we'd like to thank all military listeners for your service, unless you were part of a secret government experiment and became a psychotic super soldier. You were, were not thinking. Please don't come after us. See you next yes, Wednesday. Please don't. Mm-hmm.